I was giving some topical thoughts and comments to uh, the folks who are going to come up here and join us for this conversation. And after sitting with some of you for lunch, I can, uh, I can say that uh, it was exciting as me, as exciting as it was for me to hear this morning, it was more exciting to hear how you were reacting to what's been going on today. And uh, I think it really is a testament to uh, how everyone came with open minds, uh, candor being the top of the list, uh, to really tackle some conversations that uh, need to be had. Um, and the breakout sessions, uh, I think, uh, the ones that I sat through, truly were um, insightful, eye-opening, uh, and I believe that we really are going to uh, get things done. And this is just the step off of, uh, of where we should be going, to be very frank with you. I want to take a moment now and um, introduce the folks that we have uh, that will be joining us in this conversation. And it's, uh, it stems from where, why we're all here. We're here to eradicate sexual assault, sexual harassment. And what we have here today, ladies and gentlemen, is a bipartisan, bicameral panel assembled because it shows the depth and the breadth of this topic and the commitment of the people who have come down from Washington to share some moments with you and give us their thoughts. It truly is an honor for me to introduce these folks because all three of them are about getting things done. As a member of the Senate Armed Service Committee, and before I actually do the introduction, I'll, I'll let you all know because some people might not know, this is uh, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Esper, and myself. This is our board of directors, members of our board of directors that I'm going to introduce to you. And as a member of the Senate Armed Service Committee, Senator from North Carolina, Senator Tom Tillis, has been a standout voice, a truly standout voice on behalf of our greatest resource, which is the men and women of our uniformed services. From the great state of California, Jackie Speer, Congresswoman Speer, truly has had a laser focus on the issue of personnel for quite some time, to the fact that Newsweek bills her as one of the most fearless women in the world. I want to say in the world yet again. And finally, it's a particular honor to welcome a former Navy midshipman, home here at her old school, Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Uh, she's been serving all her life, uh, now in the 11th District of New Jersey, but prior to that, she was a fellow rotor head, which I donned my hat off, being one myself, uh, served over in Europe and the Middle East, and uh, most recently serving when she was still wearing uniform as a Russian policy officer. So now if I could ask my three distinguished guests to join me on the stage, we're going to have some questions and a discussion. What I'd like to do, folks, is just uh, prime a question, and you can or take your responses down the line as you would like to. Um, the first question that we, uh, we generated, how can academic, government, and private sector leaders work together to fight sexual misconduct? And uh, equally important, what can they learn from each other? In fact, we'll start with the midshipmen. <laughs> Well, I've been introduced as a lot of things, former Navy helicopter pilot, but never former midshipman. That's a first. And I think the last time I was in Mahan was when I had a commandant's call in the 90s, and I just had a unique experience. I went into the ladies' room, and there were no urinals, uh, which was great to see. So that's progress. Um, <laughs> So um, I think, uh, you know, I was just talking to the superintendent about this, and I think something that would be incredibly helpful in fighting this is data, is really understanding um, what the numbers are, because it's such a hard thing to have good numbers on. I, I know, you know, a lot of us were sexually harassed um, when we were in the military or outside of the military. And as a, you know, a woman who regards herself as very strong and competent, you don't want to report that. You want to handle it yourself. So just getting into an atmosphere where people feel comfortable reporting it, where they understand um, that there's going to be support, that, um, that it is something uh, that they can seek out uh, discussions on and, and get recourse for is really important. But of course, as we were saying earlier, 
sometimes when you, met, you open up that atmosphere, your numbers actually go up instead of down, and that's a good thing. Um, but you have to have some comparison. You have to be able to compare it to, um, say, other colleges and universities and what's going on there so you know, you know how much work you have left to do. So let me uh, start off by saying something very positive about the military academies, um, because oftentimes I'm not in that position. But uh, I will say that one of the things that I think the universities and colleges uh, around the country can learn from is the fact that there are climate surveys done at each of these institutions on a regular basis. And we can track every two years uh, what we're seeing among the midshipmen and cadets in terms of incidents. Uh, there is a, a very extensive participation rate. Um, I think um, Dr. Van Winkle is here, and she could probably give you the exact number, but the, the participation rate is very high. Um, I've introduced legislation over a number of years called the HALT Act that would apply to uh, public universities and private universities that receive federal funds that would mandate that those institutions also do climate surveys because that is one of the ways that um, we can start to track um, this epidemic. And it is an epidemic. It's an epidemic, as you know, in um, the college environment everywhere. I think we feel in part because the military cadets and midshipmen are the best and the brightest and um, hopefully the most disciplined that somehow they're um, a step above. But the truth of the matter is it's pretty widespread. We all know that alcohol is a, a significant component, but it's no excuse for not fixing the problem. First, I, uh, I want to welcome, I was happy to go through the, the program and see the great representation of North Carolina institutions here, so I'm glad you're here. Um, I, I think that uh, touching on the point of data, we've got to measure progress over time. And here's what you don't do if you're a service academy head. You don't tell me that our incidences are below the national average because I want our incidences in the service academies to be zero and set the standard for every other university to follow. Having said that, going through the program, I was impressed. Uh, by the way, a lot of you who have spoke on panels or presented today will most likely be getting a call because there's some extraordinary information in here. This one program, I think, was from uh, the, the speaker was from University of Windsor, where we already see a metric uh, where programs have had a dramatic uh, in, impact, I think a 50 percent impact in reported assaults. We've got to figure out the best possible programs. We've got to find the working models that have already proven themselves and scale them. And also, I think, as Congresswoman said, the Congressman or Congresswoman always? Woman. We are women. Well, I always get confused. <laughs> We're representative. Because, because Virginia Fox says Congressman. And, well, and so, okay. Um, so I think, it's, uh, I think it's important for us to have metrics that matter that we can put into place very quickly and be very aggressive about it. So, Congresswomen and Senator, uh, you are legislators. Uh, you oversee our institutions, uh, not only the educational institutions, but the, uh, the body of uniformed uh, members. What would be your priorities if you could uh, frame them up with respect to prevention of uh, sexual misconduct? Well, I think you're, we have the sexual assault issue, I think, before both of our, our uh, Armed Services Committee and I chair the personnel subcommittee. So what we want to do is on the one hand, get a lot better at prosecuting um, cases of sexual assault, but I want that to be the, uh, the remedy really is trying to do prevention. And I think it starts with always assessing our culture and again, putting these programs into place where we just end the shameless pipeline of uh, uh, sexual assault cases in our uh, in our service academies, and uh, and then we have to work on a, a prosecutorial framework that we all think is fair. That uh, on the back end, will uh, will will maybe to a certain extent um, 
contribute to prevention, but there's so much that we can do in terms of climate, in terms of reporting, in terms of sharing information so that we can let bad actors know that they're going to get our, our radar very quickly. I think um, if I can convey one message to all of you, it is to believe the victim. 92 to 98% of those that report are telling the truth. And we somehow um, have allowed either misinformation or commentary to allow us to think that maybe they're lying. I mean, it is an extraordinary number that they are telling the truth. And the vast majority of assault victims don't come forward. And they don't come forward for one reason, because they don't believe the system will work for them um, and they're fearful of retaliation. And what we see um, with the cadets and in uh, military service is retaliation is a huge problem. So uh, I have looked at both the systems and it's interesting because um, it's they're private entities, they're private systems. You have a uniform code of military justice um, for the academies, and you have a code of conduct for uh, the universities and colleges. And there's this expectation that through those systems, we are going to be able to um, somehow mete out a level of justice for all. And what we find oftentimes is that uh, justice doesn't get done. And it's in part, I think, due to not having enough resources or um, not uh, taking into account the importance of the victim. I've been on college campuses. I know UC is not here, and I regret that UC campuses are not here, all 14 of them. Um, but I remember sitting at a, a bench with a young co-ed at UC Berkeley who was sexually assaulted. She reported it. She was never interviewed, and she was never told what the result was. I mean, that's unconscionable. Uh, I've talked to cadets who have um, wanted nothing more but to be transferred to another academy. And, and that, at that time, wasn't available. We're looking at, I think, legislation this year that would make that appropriate and I've talked to all three superintendents and thank you all for being here I really think it's important that you are here uh, that we, we find some means by which the victim is truly made whole again well first of all thank you congressman Spears, for all the work you've done in this area it, it's hard work um, these are stories that not only are hard to tell but that people don't always want to hear because they're difficult and it's difficult to always know the path forward and the way forward and I know that your work has not always been welcomed in Congress and your oversight. So thank you for, for really doing that and, and drawing attention to um, some of the issues in this field. It's, you know, I would say culture um, would be the number one thing we have to attack. Some of how I think we do that is through data and, and, and understanding of it, but we see um, alcohol is certainly a problem, but, but culture can be an even worse overarching problem. And I saw it myself. When I entered the Naval Academy, and certainly this is very dated, very, very dated now, I'm been a while, but um, when I entered, uh, people came from across the country and they came from, many of them came from high schools like mine. Um, there were some people from all male or all female high schools, but mostly regular high schools. There was not a misogynistic bent to the entering freshman class, but over time, um, after reading um, James Webb's Women Can't Fight articles from Proceedings Magazine, after having a woman stand up at a, an all-hands call to ask when women would be on submarines and the CNO of the Navy saying, not in my lifetime, to a standing ovation. Um, these sorts of things break down your culture. And I'll tell you, when I served under a commanding officer that cared very much about everyone serving well and everyone's service being, um, being really applauded and, and making sure that the squadron was going to thrive, that worked out very well. When I served under a commanding officer, officer who would say things, you know, derogatory towards women or, oh, gosh, you know, that one has to do this or what have you, um, things didn't go very well. And um, so I think culture is incredibly important. And the way I think we address that is through data, 
is through um, making sure we have these climate surveys, but also through making sure that the reporting process is not so internal. And we have this problem in the military where, they're, um, the, where the stories aren't heard or the women aren't believed. Um, you know, oftentimes it, it happens that not just in the military, but throughout business, um, women make a report of some sort of unwanted sexual advances. Often, like I said, um, this isn't something that, you know, a woman wants to come forward and talk about because you feel like you should be able to handle it. Um, so you mention it, you talk about it, and then you tell somebody, your boss, but then you don't talk about it much more. It's not something you go to the lunchroom and say, you know what, I was sexually harassed and it was horrible and oh my gosh, you know, this happened, this happened, this happened. You, you pretty much, you tell your story, you try to get it handled, and that's it. Whereas the male, often the male, sometimes uh, it's, it's vice versa, but uh, who is reported, they'll tell their story left and right. Oh my gosh, you know, she just said that because she was in, you know, she was in love with me and I told her I wasn't gonna go out with her and this is just her retaliation and you know, she, ha she said this and you know, this is how it really happened and they'll talk, talk, talk. And until the point where, you know, sometimes the workforce will turn against the woman who's reported that conduct. So these are the kind of things you have to make sure to root out of your organization. You have to have the reporting regime so that this doesn't happen. So that um, you know, people who are reporting sexual assault, sexual harassment are supported in doing that. And I think we're making great strides towards that. Um, I certainly have heard through numerous people that, um, that the academy now, which you know, I love the Naval Academy, but I'm glad to report it's not the Naval Academy I attended. Um, and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, and uh, I think we need to keep moving forward in that direction. Thank you, Congresswoman. It's, uh, it's so rare that uh, one of us service secretaries get to ask the representatives question. But, um, <laughs> I'm a bit uncomfortable with that. <laughs> Payback is hell. <laughs> well, let me throw one out there. We had a fascinating conversation uh, this morning. I believe it was uh, Jackson Katz. Um, who brought up some very interesting aspects. But one of the ones that he brought up um, was, uh, and this addresses the culture, because we all agreed, it seemed we all had an agreement that whether an American college, university, or academy, we take every year a slice of what society gives us. And one of the things he brought up as an example was the corrosive nature of pornography and what that does culturally to us as a country. You as legislators, how would you react or what would be your observations on what is happening culturally and can anything be done to it or affect it from your point of view? Okay. This reminds me of a, a comment that uh, one uh, military officer said in terms of dealing with this issue at one point and says, well, it's just the hookup culture today. That's why we have this. I think it's a huge mistake to somehow excuse this kind of conduct on any level. So I think that what we need to do is make sure that we create training and prevention programs that young people will respect, um, that we hold people accountable, and that we develop the kind of expertise in the investigative function and in the prosecution of these cases so that um, we're going to have the fairest uh, jurisdictional um, action taken. But I, I'm not one to somehow suggest that because you've got um, you know, the, the readiness availability of pornography, that that how is somehow creating an environment that makes this more prevalent. I think that uh, whatever, for whatever reasons that we are dealing with this issue, we've got to fix it. Because what we oftentimes don't appreciate is the scarring that happens to the victim uh, is lifelong. It is not just uh, you know, a one and done experience. It is something that oftentimes uh, has a profound effect on them. You know, I think as a matter of public policy, 
pornography, alcohol, uh, other factors that are that are clearly linked to some of these behaviors. We have to figure out how to deal with it with respect to free speech issues. There's very little that we as uh, congressional members can do, but it doesn't mean that uh, you can't somehow have in your code of conduct in all your universities and service academies uh, some things that are just the price of admission policies, but I think they will have to be at the policy level, not rise to the level of congressional action, no matter how much we would like to do it uh, because of the constraints that we have on ourselves. But, you know, one thing I have uh, thought about that I'm going to do as a part of my, um, uh, my next class of nominations for service academies, and, and that is going to be at the point of application, creating that culture at the point in time that we have these brilliant young men and women applying to go to a service academy. I think it starts there. We should indoctrinate them uh, very early on about our expectations when we're putting them forward. I track my service academy uh, nominees through their process. We keep track of them. And I think a part of what we can do as members of Congress, we all have our service academy nominations. We all take them through things. Probably none of us have ever thought about having some focus in our orientation on these being uh, issues that are very important to us, and we're watching you. For as long as I'm a U.S. Senator, I'm watching the progress of these, um, these young, brilliant future leaders and help, help actually at that early stage in the process uh, establish a culture that has frank discussions about these things. You know, I, I come at this from, from two sides. Um, the first side is uh, that the idea that we need data. If, we, if, if there is a link between the um, pornography and our culture that's widely available and um, people having views about, um, you know, consent and sex and, and we need to address that, then we need to come up with training programs that are going to address that. Um, I don't think, I, I've not seen the data on that. So I, I can't say that I know whether or not that's an issue driving anything. Certainly it's never an excuse to never be able to say, well, you know, I watch a lot of pornography, so that's why I had to assault this woman. Uh, but, but if there is some linkage between um, what children see at a young age and, and not having a great sense of, of uh, right and wrong with respect to consent, then we certainly need to have this, you know, some data on that and study it and make sure we're addressing it correctly. That said, I will say that as a mother of young children, it is pernicious. Um, you know, there were probably, probably as I was growing up, a 10 or 11 year old, the most they might have seen is, you know, women in bras in the Sears catalog. Um, now, my um, 13 and 11 year old have seen horrific things on the internet. Um, and, and it's, hor and, I, and just about every parent can tell you that. And, you know, Short of um, just giving them a smart, you know, a flip phone, which I've thought about, um, it's uh, it's really, really scary, and it's um, and it's not limited to, to that. I mean, there are horrible things on the internet that that you you know are constantly trying to guard against, constantly trying to put programs on, on your children's viewing that can you know kind of keep them safe. That said, I was just talking to someone from the FCC um, two days ago, I think, and. And she said, you know, they, they have no regulatory power over YouTube or some of the, the videos that are put out are, are simply completely unregulated. So um, what that should and will look like in the future, it's something we're struggling with now because this is kind of a brave new world. Can I add one thing? Certainly, uh, certainly for the academies, and I'm here for the universities as well, you evaluate these applicants uh, in terms of academic excellence, uh, in terms of uh, athletic ability in some cases and um, leadership we might need to be adding a fourth component about moral fitness i don't know how we would measure it but maybe there needs to be yet another component in and, assessing and it's a the, mission of the academy morally mentally and physically i think that's a great point i'm going to ask one more question and then i'm going to open it up to the floor so start thinking about your questions for the three of you, if you could share with us, um, realizing what the conference is here about, what you have learned about this topic, and what, as a legislator in your position, would be your insights 
and or guiding comments for us going forward? Well, I, I think one thing, I know uh, uh, Senator McSally, I believe, gave the keynote here this morning. And um, my focus as the uh, chair of the personnel subcommittee is bringing forward courageous people like Martha McSally and uh, Joni Ernst and others to work in collaboration to have the tough subjects. So, Secretary, you said that what you were struck most by in this session and what some of the attendees were struck by was the candid conversations uh, that you had today. We need to continue to have those candid conversations in committee hearings um, and candid conversations amongst ourselves where we all want the same end result. We may have differences in terms of as a matter of public policy how we do that but we've got to really double down on it and we've had hearings and we will have additional hearings working with senator gillibrand uh, senator mcsally on the personnel subcommittee um we, we have we've got to make sure also that the the leaders the commanders who have uh input uh are also bringing forth good ideas but also giving us the feedback we need when they think that the um, that well-intentioned policies moving forward may be problematic. We, we've got to make sure that we push that. And the only other thing, and I think it um, relates to one of the opening comments here, the thing that drives me crazy about the men and women in uniform who come before our committees is they always have a can-do attitude to everything that we're proposing, even when they don't think it's a good idea, we'll make it work. And I don't know how we break that. I think in some cases, it may be the very reason why some victims do not come forward because they think they've got to make the best of a bad situation versus understanding it's in our, our collective best interest for them to come forward. So candor, a lot of information, uh, more more data for us to have well-informed public policy decisions in a short interval. This isn't something I want to declare victory on five years from now. This is something that I want to make measurable progress in this Congress. And I love the fact that you've referred to data along the way. It's got to be driven by the facts and it's got to be measurable. And we have to make sure that we put the infrastructure in place to measure progress over time. Uh, credit those who are making measurable progress um, and, and go after those who aren't. So I would say that, you know, we do have data as it relates to the academy. We have seen um, an increase in assaults and we've seen an increase in sexual harassment. One of the most jarring statistics for me is that 50% of the cadets and midshipmen in our academies have reported sexual harassment. Uh, the number of sexual assaults, I believe it's at the military academy, correct me if I'm wrong, superintendent, from in two years has gone up 50%. Um, now, in part, some of this could be due to um, more willing to report, but whether it's at the military academies or it's at the university um, setting, uh, it's, it's a problem that we have not um, unlocked the solution to. And the rolling of the eyes that I hear about in terms of the, the training that goes on, oh, we've got to go through this again, um, it is not connecting with the, the students. We do see a difference between the college campuses, the, the really vulnerable times at college campuses, and many of you who are in private universities can speak to this, is that orientation period, is that period from September, October through um, December of, of a freshman year, or at the end of their college years and um, their senior years. What we see at the academies is that it's not happening when they're plebes. It's happening when they're in their second year. That's when you see a greater incidence of sexual assault in particular. And it's when you start to loosen, I guess, the, um, the, the kind of control. The other thing that we found in the data that we have been collecting is 
they're starting, and, and Dr. Van Winkle can speak to this, the, the concern we have now is that there's a backlash happening. And this, this is something that we've all got to deal with, that as the number of women are increasing in our academies, and the numbers are, are remarkable, and the leadership roles that many of these women have as first in their classes is pretty remarkable too. But what we're seeing is that there's a backlash against women, um, which from an academy standpoint, we've got a nip in the bud, probably not as much of an issue at the private university. Um, I think uh, what the senator said and what the congressman said, you know, you both made some great points. I do think I would just add to that the reporting, um, how it's reported, making sure that the midshipmen have a place to go outside the chain of command or outside the brigade of midshipmen, um, and making sure that uh, as we go even, you know, greater into our actual services, uh, making sure that the reporting and the investigations don't simply happen. Sometimes it's just far too insular um, and far too easy for um, people to cover it up or to uh, suggest that people might not want to report it or then face backlash should they report it. So I open the floor to any questions. The microphones are at the end of the aisles here. Uh, and as you uh, come up to uh, ask a question, because you have a unique uh, a panel up here, which uh, you don't get to ask questions of too often. I would like to uh, just share with our panel mates that uh, one of the things that the three service secretaries, when we put this um, uh, convivium together, was to put a commitment out to all the participants here. And hopefully uh, everyone will join us, or clearly a majority, which is to share data. Uh, and, and to share best practices and to make a commitment, uh, this being the first of, of an ongoing set of, of conviviums that we'll hold, uh, to work towards uh, interaction amongst each other. With that, I'll open the floor. All right. I'm a little short for this microphone. Um, rape prevention programming and response services uh, rely heavily on the Violence Against Women Act which expired about four months ago at this point and is currently waiting to be reauthorized. So I would like to know what each of you is doing to get this important legislation reauthorized. You wanna go? <laughs> well, the good news is that the House passed um, the uh, VAWA reauthorization today. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a co-sponsor. Yeah, both, so we both, both co-sponsored co it. Of it. Um, and, um, and, and Senator, you're going to hear this as you contemplate it. One of the elements, we've, it's not just a blanket reauthorization. Some would like to just see it reauthorized, reauthorized in its uh, previous forms. It's been, it's never been a political issue. It's always been bipartisan. It's been renewed three times, um, but we want to improve it. And so one of the areas is um, where someone has been convicted of um, domestic violence or stalking or uh, an intimate relationship with someone where there's violence that we would be authorized to take the guns away from them. That is, um, it, it's pretty common sense, but um, it does not have the support of the NRA, and so that's a battle that is going to have to be uh, fought. One of the provisions that I got into the, into VAVA, what, that was a bill I had introduced, uh, really came from an experience in New York where I read that a, a police officer had sex with someone who was in his custody and handcuffed and he got off because there was the ability to argue consent. Um, so we now have um, language in the measure that will relate to federal officers and an incentive for states, some 30 states uh, don't um, have a provision to prevent um, the, the defense of consent to be um, ill, not allowed. 
And so we're going to try and create incentives for them to pass that legislation by having them access more VAWA funds. But it's another component that we've put in to try and make sure that when, when people of authority have extraordinary power over someone else, um, you can't argue that there is consent. And so uh, and that, that happens in, in any number of settings. I mean, I've worked on it with, uh, in the academic world where you have teaching assistants at the graduate level who become sexually harassed and assaulted by their um, advisors. And there, there is a very difficult relationship there because your advisor is the one who's going to give you a recommendation or help you get the grant money. So there, whenever there's a, a disproportionate relationship, um, it, it speaks to um, a problem that we've got to address. Well, I'm on the uh, Judiciary Committee. I would assume if that's moving out of the House, that that's something that Senator Grassley will take up. I have, um, as Speaker of the House back in North Carolina, we, we took up a number of measures over four years that had to do with sexual assault, had to do with uh, human trafficking, and a uh, number of other matters that I thought that we were able to do on a bipartisan basis. I hope that we're able to do the same thing here. Good afternoon, my name is Katie Conlin. I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins and an alum, alumna from UC Berkeley, actually for the record, you are represented. Um, I have two short questions that I kind of would like to see what your opinion is. The first being, do you think that there's a way to change the way we talk about accusations? Because the way we have these conversations, particularly in the media, we list the accolades of the accused and talk about this person with all this authority and all of the success was accused of um, X, Y, or Z. And the way we form that, it's almost like you have to attack this person's success before you can talk about what the issue actually is. Like the fact that when we hear about a gold medal winner swimmer at Stanford sexually assaulting someone, we talk about his swimming record and not what this individual is accused of doing. And I think that's incredibly problematic and also becomes a further barrier for someone to want to accuse someone who is in a position of power via direct power professionally or status in some capacity. My other question is, we put all these efforts into investigating individuals, but then is there a way to generate communication between groups besides just data such that if someone is found guilty of something, they can't just switch to a different university or switch to the private sector or switch to some other organization and not have that finding kind of follow them or at least not follow them but let the new institution be aware of what this person has been found guilty of. Is there a way to open up that communication? Well, I'll uh, cover the second question. Um, there is, I know that they, uh, uh, the, the Department of Defense is uh, working on standing up an information sharing tool among the, uh, uh, among the department. We know, I can't remember the, uh, the name of the uh, off-the-shelf product that some universities have implemented that let people share information. The sad fact. Callisto? Callisto. Uh, the sad fact about uh, sexual assault is that it's very seldom only done once by the uh, uh, perpetrator. Uh, it's done often and uh, or frequently it is uh, multiple times. And you're right, they could serve from one jurisdiction to the other. So as we start standing up this capability to at least communicate within a university or university system, I think that we ultimately need to scale it so that there's really no place to hide or no place to run. And uh, I believe that once we get uh, capability stood up within the, the lines of service that we have to look at how, now, how we interconnect. And, and obviously there's gotta be governance. Uh, one thing I will tell you about the accused, um, not the specific point that you made, which I think a very, very important one, but we're trying to collect information from other countries uh, as a result of a, a recent committee meeting that we had with subject matter experts. Um, we want to go out and be instructed by policies that uh, we're trying to balance the, you know, we, we, we have to balance the rights of, of the victim and the accused. 
And we've got to figure out how to do that. And hopefully some of our policy proposals will be instructed by what has worked and what's had to be adjusted with some of these other nations that quite honestly are ahead of us on uh, protecting the rights of the accuser. Yes, uh, you know, as far as the first part, um, I, I served, I, I certainly dealt with sexual harassment myself. I knew other women who were sexually assaulted. Um, but I have been shocked at the stories coming out and the breadth of stories coming out um, in the past few years. It, it, has, it has just really taken me aback. And I, I feel of all people, if, if I'm shocked, who wouldn't be? Because I felt like I, of all people, should have known what was going on in our society at a, in a deeper way and at a, in a better, better way. So um, I think we're learning how to deal, deal with this. We are caught flat-footed when we're dealing with it in the court of public opinion. Um, when we don't have the ability to weigh the evidence or to uh, weigh the testimony as we would in a court of law. I'm a former federal prosecutor. Um, and unfortunately, that has been um, what we've been doing. And I think we've really been suffering for it. And, and, and I think, um, you know, as women, we feel so troubled that we see professional women and we kind of think there but for the grace of God, you know, is some woman coming forward and telling her story, which I think many of us believe um, in the stories, but, but still don't feel, even if we believe what they're saying, that we have the correct, uh, correct ability to weigh that evidence and, and, and we don't have the ability to hear from um, the person that's being accused and they're not giving a fair chance to discuss that. And it, it's just, it feels like a, a very bad system or a very bad way to weigh the evidence. So um, to the extent that we can handle a lot of these accusations, um, and come up with a plan to get them out of sort of the court of public opinion and into our court system or into some other um, way of arbitrating that, that would, I think, be much better. So one of the, um, the problems we have is that, uh, let's just take the military for instance. There are about 15,000 cases of year, a year of sexual assault in the military. It happened mostly to men because there are more men in the military, obviously, than women. But of those 15,000, only 5,000 of them report. We've got already two thirds of the people not reporting because they fear the system won't do justice. And of the 5,000, about 500 go to court martial. And of the 500 that go to court martial, only 250 end up. So if you look at that, those numbers, it, it makes me want to look at our Uniform Code of Military Justice. What, what do we have to do to make this right? Now, um, one of the things we need to do, which we haven't done yet, and hopefully we can do this year in the NDAA, is deal with the issue that those who are convicted at 250 that should be on the sex offender list, that information is not necessarily shared with states. Some states it is, some states it's not. States get a um, Article 15 um, uh, conviction. They don't know what that is, and, and they, they can't make sense of it. So I, I think what we need to do is create a, um, an actual sex offender list within the military that will that um, states can access, so they'll be able to identify persons who have actually been put on that list. As it relates to academia, um, we are address, or attempting to address the issue of the sexual harasser or assaulter who's a professor who then um, is found to have sexually assaulted or harassed and then goes to another institution by um, having them disclose if they have had a uh, determination that they have sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. Um, so it could limit their grant money that they can. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate all of you recognizing this issue as an epidemic. I would agree with that, having worked in law enforcement and now on a college campus. Um, and I appreciate the support for getting this right and doing better on college campuses and at the academies. Um, and as a result of 
the legislation and the support and the resources that are being poured into the process on college campuses, things are getting better. Reports are going up, students are getting better services, and those who are responsible for the response and education are being educated themselves. So investigators who are responding to these reports on college campuses are required to get trauma-informed training. It's really important. Right, and this is great for those women and men who are privileged enough to go to college and to go to the academies. But this is an epidemic that's affecting everyone in this country. And so my question is, when are we going to turn our resources and our attention to law enforcement and their response? And to making sure that they're required to get training on how to appropriately respond to this very special type of criminal act, to the trauma that's involved. When are we gonna start to focus on that? Because I can tell you, I have students come to me, they're reporting, and they're going through the process. And perpetrators are being held accountable where appropriate. Those same students are going to law enforcement. And within a moment, they're either leaving the station because they don't feel believed by the, the responding officers, or if they are, the prosecutors are declining to prosecute. And I don't think it's because they don't care. I think it's because police, um, law enforcement generally, prosecutors generally are not getting the training that they need to really understand these issues. I didn't understand it when I started. And then I went to higher ed, and now I regret half the decisions I made as a prosecutor. When are we gonna turn our lens there? You know, that's a, that's a great question, and um, unfortunately it's piecemeal across the country. We have certain prosecutors' offices that handle it quite well and others that don't. Um, and I think uh, we do need to look more carefully at addressing this. Again, I, I think now is the time when it is coming to the forefront of so, you know, in so many people's minds and something that I think we would like to look at. You know, I would also say that you, uh, you raise a very important point that we have not spent much time, whether it's at the academies, in the military, or in civilian society, in, in terms of training people to uh, understand how to inquire from a trauma victim of what their issues are. I, I know when we had some training with, um, within the military for a period of time, the question that kept being asked was, well, why didn't you say no? Why, why didn't you scream? And you have to appreciate that when you're being raped, the, the fear factor can be so great that all you want it to do is for it to end. And so you don't say anything. Um, so being well-educated is, is a really important uh, component. I also think that we should mandate that there be rape kits on every college campus and that we have sane nurses that can provide the um, proper um, extraction of um, the, the detail. Because the humiliation that a woman goes through when she has to travel 30 or 40 miles to get to a hospital to have a, a rape kit done is, you know, it, it adds just so much more um, pain to the experience. We had a hearing this week where three service members testified about their recent experience of sexual assault in the military. And I asked them a question. Was the process that you endured after the sexual assault worse than the rape? And each one of them said yes. I think one thing when we're looking at the subject of uh, today and tomorrow's sessions, that first off, we want to be laser focused on, on the challenge that, that, that brought everybody into the room. Yours points to a, a bigger problem that we need to address, and I think we have to take it in layers. When uh, I think if you've been in law enforcement, you may be familiar with the CALEA program and certain certifications that law enforcement agencies receive that can have an impact on their eligibility for grants and, and other funding. A part of what we probably need to do is go back and determine the extent to which those certifications have an emphasis on this, have subject matter experts, and, uh, and build from the ground up there so that those are things that we can do immediately. They're relatively easy lifts um, while we go about attacking this challenge ahead of us, and there's so much more to do. I don't want to disadvantage anyone in the, uh, in the upper uh 
loaves up there. So if anyone has a question, please stand up, and uh, I'm more than happy to recognize you. Just have to use your command voice. Um, it looks like we're coming to an end, but before we do, I just wanted to, uh, I'm not going to call her out. She's not expecting this, but Dr. Van Winkle, if you could stand up and just identify yourself, because here is the person who is the primary coordinator and our data meister at the Department of Defense. And for all of you, when we talk about sharing data, we have our data is already up public and available, but uh, Dr. Van Winkle really is a, a contact point for you. And if you want to say a couple of words, Doctor, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would just reiterate what was said, that I think one of our greatest strengths is the data that we have. Um, I come from a place, Kenyon College graduate, we have Kenyans here, here we go. Um, where I learned uh, early on that it is impossible to make decisions in this space unless you know what's going on. And it's hard to know what's going on. And I say that having gone through a few testimonies. Nice to be on the side. And areas. you did well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, I, I don't like what we find um, every year. But the fact that we have the information, we know what's happening is our greatest strength. And that transparency is our greatest strength. And it's not to say that we look to compare ourselves with anybody else. We don't. We have higher expectations for ourselves. But we are all in this together. And it's a challenge that I've seen in the civilian sector when I worked there and in the military as I work here. Um, and so I, I really do just echo what was said about the importance of understanding what is happening on your campuses, what is happening at our academies, and what's happening in our force so we can make better decisions in this space. Uh, I certainly would welcome anyone um, to contact me. We are always open with our data. It's publicly available. Um, if you ever have any issues with it, contact me personally. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Well, if there's no more questions, uh, to the panel members on behalf of Drs. Esper, Wilson, and myself, thank you very much for your participation in this. It shows the dedication to this problem, and we're going to solve it. Um, for the crowd, thank you for your questions. We're adjourned, and I gather the next, uh, I look to you, Melissa, we're off to a no-host social, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to let you take command. But uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, panel members. <laughs>